Brothers of Omega, Supreme Council, our 2017 Lifetime Achievement Award goes to no other person. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let's give a round of applause. He's coming to speak. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you to Brother Dr. Mark Stevens, the committee chair, to the Grand Basilisk, Brother Tony Knox, to the first Vice Grand Basilisk, Dr. David Marion, to Brother Damien Charles, and to our wonderful bishop. Uh, words are inadequate to say thank you. But we give all the praise to whom it rightfully belongs. For whatever we are of good, it is a gift from our Creator. Yes, so I say in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. I thank him for all of his prophets and messengers and the scriptures which they brought. But I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I could never thank Allah for the day that I found the man that I was looking for all my life. As a young Christian boy, I cried myself to sleep over the hurt and pain and suffering of our people at the hands of their tormentors. Yes, My mother, a beautiful, beautiful black woman, mm -hmm. taught me to love my black self yes, and to love my beautiful black mother. My father, was a light-skinned Jamaica man who was a philanderer. But the Rolling Stone stayed home long enough to plant a seed. that became Lewis Walcott. I sang in the choir at my church and I have always loved Jesus. But I was angry with the church. How could they love a man like Jesus and treat a people who believed in him like they did. The hypocrisy of the church is what I as a young boy condemned. And in my Bible class I asked my Bible teacher 
If God could send prophets to those who suffered slavery and injustice in the past, why has not God sent someone to deliver us? My Bible teacher couldn't answer such a question. I was seven, I was eight, I was nine. But I always felt God's spirit upon me. So as a young boy of 11 years old, my mother sent me to New York to visit my uncle. My uncle is from the Caribbean as well as my mother. And my uncle had the picture of a black man on the wall. That was very strange because in the homes of black people, there were no black people on their mantelpiece or in a high place on their walls. My mother being a subject of the king of England, King George, she had a picture of King George, Queen Elizabeth, and a white picture of Jesus. But in my uncle's home, there were no white people around. <laughs> and there was a picture of a black man on the wall. And I said, who is that man? And he said, that's a man that came to unite black people. And that looked like the man that I was looking for. I was a shorty, so I asked him to get a chair so I could stand in it and drink in the features of that man on that wall. And I said, where is he that I might go and meet him? Mind you, I'm just 11 years old, but I wanted to meet a man that was standing for us. And he said, oh, they call me Gene. They said, Gene, he's, he's passed away. And the tears rolled down my cheek because I had come so close, but yet so far. So I kept on searching. I was a violinist who had won all kinds of awards in my native Boston. And my parents being from the Caribbean, singing in the choir, I became a ballad singer, and then I sang calypsos. And as a young man, I toured singing and dancing and playing my violin, but my soul was not comforted. It would be when I was 19 that I heard that God had chosen a man for us. And as I walked in the street of Boston, the tears fell from my eyes and I said, God, why didn't you choose me? You know 
I love my people. And then the answer came so quick, not that nobody spoke to me. <laughs> but he chose Elijah Muhammad. In 1931, he came, 30, and then chose Elijah in 31. And I wasn't even born at that time, so. I said, let me go and find this man and offer him my life. I married my childhood sweetheart while I was in college. When I was a sophomore, I wanted to be a cure. And I went on Secret Pro. And they beat the hell out of me. <laughs> but when you make up your mind, because you want something bad enough, then there was nothing that they could do to me to make me turn back. It blindfolded me and ran me into trees. <laughs> but, but I was ready to be a cute. And the morning that we were su supposed to go on open pro, yes, sir. they told me that somebody dropped a black ball. I was a lamp and I had learned all the chapters and I learned the 133rd Psalm. Yes, sir. Behold how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But then I didn't know the power of a black ball. So I went back to my dormitory and I wept. I never pledged to any fraternity during my college years because if I wasn't good enough to be a Q, I didn't want any other fraternity. But what was the reason that I was blackballed? It's the same reason that some did not want me to receive this prestigious award. Because as a 19-year-old, on a southern college campus in the segregated South, I saw professors having sexual encounters with little southern girls to give them good grades that they may graduate to go out and teach black children what? The art of screwology? <laughs> and what you can gain by giving of yourself. That hurt me as a 19 year old. So I spoke out against it. I took my ukulele and I wrote a song. I wrote it on the train on the way down south. 
because I grew up in the North and I never had been South. So I wanted to go South so I could feel the pain of my brothers and sisters who were lynched and raped and robbed in the South. So my train stopped in Washington and I had an eight hour stopover at Union Station. And I said, well, my mother had given me a crisp $20 bill. We were very poor people, but I had 20. <laughs> and I wanted to go to a movie. So I went to the theater and I stood in line, but people were staring at me. I wanted to check to see whether I was covered. I was not uncovered. And somebody walked over to me and said, we don't sell tickets to Negroes. I turned around and walked up that street because a buddy of mine that graduated with me, his name was Sterling Kirby. He was killed in Korea, dying for this. And I could not go to a movie. I don't know about nobody else. But for me, I had to speak against the hypocrisy of America. Now, I'm not talking about little white folks. I'm talking about a country that was doing this to us after bringing us across the Atlantic in the transatlantic slave trade and taking away from us our name, our language, our country, our God, our history. So I wrote a song on the way down to North Carolina. And the song was called, Why America is no democracy. I'm just 19, seven, 18. And I sang it at the freshman talent night. <laughs> I was a strange kind of person. There were beautiful girls that came from these beautiful little towns in North Carolina and they usually have their boyfriends that they left at home. And the brothers had their girlfriends that they left at home. And usually in college life, you find the person that you might one day make your life's partner. But I already had one. And when I came to college, my wife today was my girlfriend yesterday. So none of the girls, as beautiful as they were, attracted me. And people may have thought I was a little strange, you know. And I really was in that. <laughs> but that girl that I put on the wall in my room, she meant a lot to me. And being faithful to my word, to her, meant a lot to me. I was baptized in the principle of doing to others 
what you would like to have done by you. So I wouldn't want nobody cruising on my girl. <laughs> so I didn't want to give her what I did not want for her, so I didn't want it for myself. So I was the stranger. I would go downtown and challenge white folk. You know. <laughs> I would put on a West Indian accent and act like I just come to the country. <laughs> I figure what the hell. I'm a stranger, so they're not going to kill me. So I talk about them bad. <laughs> so during my summer, I went up to Canada to perform in Montreal. And there I was propositioned over and over again. One beautiful young black woman found where I was, my room was, and she rang the bell. I went downstairs, mm -hmm. and she had a handful of money. And she put it in my hand. I said, oh, sister, you work so hard for your money. And I get a decent salary from the nightclub. I put the money back in her hand because I could not have my integrity bought for a dollar. I'm not saying to you that I'm a holy man. But I can't be bought. That's what makes me dangerous to the enemy because there is nothing that he has that he can offer me that I will betray you and the future of us as a people. I cherish the role that you all put on me. The role of the illustrious founders of Omega Sci-Fi. I thank you for walking me through and let me see the noble men, the men of Omega that have shaken the country and the world. But I, uh, I was happy to be a lamp. Because David, the psalmist, said, the law of God is a lamp unto my feet. I dwell on that law night and day. This is what Omega men should always strive for. Manhood in the face of an enemy who kills men who stand up. But it's better to die standing up than bowing down to your enemy as an Omega man.
uprightness. That's one of the founding principles. To be upright. The Holy Quran says Abraham was neither a Christian or a Jew. He was an upright man and he was not of the polytheists. Can you stand to walk with a man who strives every day of his life to be upright to God? These are ideals of our founders. Yes, sir. Right. That's right. The ideal doesn't mean that we all are there. Right. But it's put before us as an eternal guide so that as long as we live, we strive for those fundamental principles that makes an omega man a man after God. Wow. Intelligence, intellect, learning, scholarship. My dear little girlfriend got pregnant, so I had to leave college. things happen. <laughs> she wanted me to stay in college. I said, I, I can't stay in no college and you are pregnant. I got to go out and get some money to feed my family. Because a man is not a man. If you make babies and you will not support your children and support the women who lay down and give themselves to a man and then the man walks away like he did nothing. I'm an Omega man. I don't need a pen because your illustrious founders were not the founders of the principles that undergird this organization. I cherish this robe. I didn't expect it, but I looked in the faces of the first founders of this great fraternity. I looked at their busts and I thank you for honoring them for in honoring them you honor the best of yourself. Right. Several years ago a basilisk by the name of Al Reynolds who helped me get started rebuilding the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad but he was a, a basilisk of a graduate chapter yes, sir. and he came to my home and offered me my pen yes, sir. and said brother with what you have done you are an Omega man. And he gave me my pen. I, I thanked him. There's no need to apologize for the actions of ignorance. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Ignorance gives us a chance to teach and remove the ignorance. 
if I could see the man that blackballed me. I would say to him, I forgive you, brother. Because you like one of those that uh, helped to nail Jesus. You sing the song, Were You There? When they crucified my Lord. We are always there. Some of us have a hammer. Some of us have nails. And some of us are like weak disciples who ran away when Jesus was carrying the cross to that final earthly destination. All our great leaders were evil spoken of by the media that Mr. Trump calls. What? Booker T. Washington suffered from fake news. Adam Clayton Powell suffered from fake news. Marcus Garvey suffered from fake news. Martin Luther King suffered from fake news. Kwame Toure suffered from fake news. So wait a minute. Do you believe in the Sermon on the Mount? What you gonna tell us, Farrakhan? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about the Lord. Because I want us to be better at following him. See, worship is false because he never asked us to worship him. They say, good master. He said, wait, why call it thou me good? There's none good but the Father. Come on and let's, let's talk about it. Huh? They said, Jesus, he said, God, in the book of John, God is a spirit. And those who worship, who? Him. Who? Him. Must worship him in spirit. and truth. Thank you. So Jesus never asked you to worship him. He asked us all to follow him. There's a difference because you can worship a man with your mouth, but it takes more than your mouth to walk in the footsteps of an upright man, a man who was a man, a man who had intellect and integrity. But he never had a degree from the colleges of his day. And fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have any letters behind my name. But I'm a doctor. By God's permission, if you listen to me, your eyes will come open. Your ears will become unstopped. 
And if you repeat what you hear me say, you will not have a dumb, stammering tongue. You will be stammering or speaking like a man to men without fear. So, Brother told me to talk. I said, I wouldn't talk. I don't want to talk. I'm so honored by the honor that you have given to me. I didn't want to talk. I just wanted to thank you. But the best way to thank you is to talk. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to close this. Because my brother, is it Damien Charles? Where is he? Brother Damien? You sang beautifully. But he sang the oft-repeated prayer of the Christian family. Do I sound like a Christian to you? <laughs> it's because I really am. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm an Episcopalian. I'm Catholic. I'm a Jew. Oh, no, Farrakhan. <laughs> I grew up in church. I don't hate the church. Muslims are crazy as heck. Who want to kill somebody because they're a Christian? By the way, what was the religion of Jesus? I think, I think I'll take a drink. In the book of John, he makes many I am's. But he never said, I'm a Christian. So some of you hypocrites that tell the grand basilis, how could you a Christian organization give such an honor to one of those Muslims. But wait a minute, Farrakhan, you said you was a Jew. I said, that's right. I had some rabbis at my dinner table. Boy, were they shocked. They didn't want me to correct them. They said, you don't correct us. I said, man, this is an arrogant man. <laughs> you mean you can't take correction from a black man? Who you didn't make? You didn't give me none of your degrees. But you can tell I got them. I didn't have to come to you to get them. So the scripture said, how come this man not having letters is learned? And believe me, I ain't had a note in front of me. I don't need notes. I stand up and let God use me and there's not one of you in this audience that what I've said already has not touched you where you are I don't know you but the God I serve knows you all so if I reach you in your bedroom or in your bathroom it's because none of us can hide from God
this brother I remember my preacher brother they, they pull on these things you know when they get the spirit <laughs> I'd like to close with the Lord's prayer now here were people following a master teacher before I get to that I want to show you why I'm a Jew see a Jew is a person that's in a covenant relationship with God and in that covenant relationship we are bound to obey the laws statutes and commandments of God uh -huh. you're a Christian right good they were talking to Jesus and one of the disciples said master would you teach us how to pray Now, they evidently were already praying, but how? The methodology. How do you reach the Father? Do so you reach him like this? Our Father. That, you stop right there. I didn't have one. I had one, but I didn't have one. But our Father, see, he took Jesus from a manger. And at 12 years of age, he confounded the scholars in Jerusalem. When I was 12 years up in doing the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I was in the holy city of Mecca confounding the scholars of Islam with the knowledge that my teacher had given me. See, when I'm there, they bow to me. Oh, yes. Some of them drop down on their knees and I grab them and pick them up. Some preachers do that as well. I refuse to accept that. When Reverend Jackson see me, he'll go down on his knees. Stop it, Reverend. Stop it. But why are you doing that? Because I have withstood. Like no other black man has withstood. The slings and the arrows. That's how you can tell I'm from God. Because my enemies are those in power in the government of the United States of America. That's why they don't want me to have this. And I hope after today, you will not regret it. <laughs> but if you're looking for white handouts, they may say, well, the mayor of Memphis gave me the key to the city. I said, oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I came back to Memphis. <laughs> And the Jewish power in Memphis had him in a semi a circle, and he was in the center. 
and they ordered him, you take back that key to the city from Louis Farrakhan. He told all of them, you can go to hell. <laughs> Now that man don't have testicles like dried raisins. <laughs> Omega man. They don't get theirs at Walmart. And we get ours from God who makes man not niggers. So, look at this word. Our Father. So Father, whatever you did for Jesus, if I follow him, you do it for me because I'm your son too. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, what? Thy will, where? Whose will is being done now on earth? It ain't Jesus' will. It's the will of Satan. That's why there's so much hate and rape and robbery and murder and deception in the world. This is not the world of Jesus. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. What do you need, Jesus? I need some Omega men to help me build this kingdom on earth. I need me some Kappas, some Alphas, some Sigmas that want to see the kingdom of God come to the earth. This brotherhood is a sign. Of the bigger brotherhood. That's what you saw at the Million Man March. So when that brother said, I don't know what we're going to face tomorrow. But living or dead, it's good to be here. My Supreme Captain, Brother Sharif, who is my regional minister, standing there. He met with all the law enforcement in Washington. And they told him, if anything go down, we got a path that we can get the minister out. Did they say that, Brother Sharif? Yes, sir. It's interesting. On that day, Clinton left town. <laughs> On that day, Supreme Court closed down. On that day, Congress shut down. On that day, city government show closed down. Well, when I say Congress, that means the Senate and the House of Representatives. Well, none of them there. Some of the black ones snuck down to the mall. And when they saw all those men, 
They all want to talk. Can you get me on the program? So they let every one of them have something to say. I didn't come on till late in the afternoon. And they had to shout out. I don't want to hear no more of this. We want fire time. <laughs> the white man understood that if a so-called non-Christian could call and 85% of those brothers, they were Christians. But they said, man, this should never happen again. So the doors of the church that were open to me before, they closed. Yeah, that's right. They called me the Antichrist. Wow. And scared people. I went overseas and took the message of reconciliation and brotherhood to Africa, to Asia, to the Middle East, to Central and South America, in your name. And everywhere I went overseas, they honored me. And that fulfilled the scripture, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own house. Jesus said, if any man would be my disciple, he gave you three things you had to do. The first was deny yourself. The second was pick up your cross. And the third is follow me. If nobody's buking and scorning you, you ain't no follower of Jesus. If nobody's talking evil about you, check yourself. You have made a contract and a covenant with the world, so you belong to the world, so the world loves its own. Since the Million Man March, we went back to Washington on three three different occasions. Yes, yes, Almost the same result. Yes, sir. Not two million, but a little over a million. And, and this last time, didn't nobody want to walk with me because I said justice or else. I sit down with people, hey, 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 Farrakhan, oh, what, what you mean by or, or else? <laughs> He's threatening white people. <laughs> the or else is God. Yes, You're either going to give us justice or God is going to take your country. No, 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 no. I'm sitting down now. None of you voted for Trump. As Trump said, Crooked Hillary was your girl. Lion Bill. played a saxophone with some dark glasses on and tricked you into believing he was the first black president. I know most Omega men didn't go for that. But Trump is in now. And I said Sunday in my lecture, 
How are you going to have uh, an election so important in the greatest country on earth and God is not involved? We gave them the best that we had in Barack Obama. And wait, wait, wait now. How did they treat the black man? I don't think he's an Omega man, right? What, did you ever join a fraternity? No, yeah, right. <laughs> While he was campaigning, he was so magnificently brilliant. White people going for him, black people, red people, yellow people, Asian people, gays, straight, everybody going for that beautiful black brother. But when he got in, the Republicans said on the night he was elected, we'll never let him pass any legislature. Did they say it? So it most everything that he did except the health care. He got that through Congress. But the rest by executive order. Because no matter how beautiful that man was to them, he was still a nigger. Now I'm closing, but God needs men to help him build his kingdom. Because he has chosen the rejected and the despised of this world to help him build his kingdom. I know some of you that are Omega, you want the best. And I understand that. But you walk by people who are the best. That have not been awakened to their greatness. The scripture says, ye are all God's children of the most high God. So Omega, I don't want you barking. Because you ain't no dog. Stop it. Give an intelligent sound. No, I'm not condemning. I'm joining. <laughs> but what you showed me downstairs, all those great men, not one of them was a dog. They didn't make ugly woof woof sounds. They were intelligent men who mastered every field of human endeavor. They are the born leaders of the people to shape and build the kingdom of God on earth. How can you build a kingdom with no earth that you can call your own? Give us this day. What, Brother Damien? I beggar, look. Give me, Lord. That's what you've been saying to white folks. 
170 years or more up from slavery, we still asking the white man to give us what we could unite and give ourselves. We got to stop it. Give us this day our daily bread. America's for sale. But if we pooled our resources, you know how the Jews got so rich? They bought up the Delta. And they owned the, the uh, plantations. And they worked our fathers and mothers. And cotton became king. And they turned that cotton into lint and cloth. And the Jews in the north became masters of the needle trades while we were picking the cotton in the south. And they became so rich that Lehman Brothers, who owned the cotton plantations in Alabama, set up on Wall Street. You really need to know what happened to us so as Omega men, listen to me good now. We can't do it alone as Omega men. Omega, Psi, Phi. So God sent a lamp. Go ahead. Go ahead. That is the star of God. Twenty pearls and a shield in violet. Because you kings, you rulers. With two swords that make a cross. That represents the duality of your nature. There's one part of our nature that is carnal, it's the flesh. That's making demands on Omega, Omega men. But there's the upright side of man that the enemy is always trying to corrupt so that the flesh will be your God. Omega men, not a dog. Dog spelled backwards is God and a God turned backward becomes a dog and that's the way we treat our women I don't have time I gotta go <laughs> Because that's what got me blackballed in the first place. <laughs> I love you all. I thank you for the honor. And I pray that I will bring honor to the role that you have draped me in. And bring honor to the founders of this great fraternity. I humbly... Thank you from the depth of my heart for making me. Oh, God. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Next we have the solo
my brother Henry Porter. Let's give the minister another round, please. I really don't appreciate having to come up here. <laughs> you put me in you put me in trouble. If you invite me back next year, I might I might uh, consider to come and do it then. But I'm getting ready to take my seat. Let, let, let me tell you, when our brother Stephen called me and asked me to do that, you not just had my right knee replacement and and when they asked me, I wasn't gonna let a knee or anything else to keep me from here tonight. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I knew I had to do something special. And initially I said I was going to sing uh, You'll Never Walk Alone. That's great. Because it, it had talked about you have to keep hope in your heart and, 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 and the time in which we are living now, particularly when they have this person that's in the position of president, uh, 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 we need to it just walked through the storm. That's right. But then I thought I'd do the impossible dream. Let me tell you why. With the understanding that no dream is impossible, because the Bible teaches us stuff. If you believe, all things are possible. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. And so I'm going to sing the impossible dream with the understanding that. No dream is impossible because the, in the, in Omega sometimes be saying, you who have dreamed if you act, they will come true. Well, we are honoring a man tonight who had a dream and he acted to make the dream come true. So, and tell you how I got to this, my little boom box here. I came and I asked the folk over there, I say, uh, I got this track on this CD can you play this? They say, no. <laughs> I say, well, I gave a young brother my key to my a trunk to my car. I say, go get my boom box out of my trunk. <laughs> now, it's, it, it's, it, it operates on battery. And if the batteries don't work, I'm going to do like uh, my, my brother over there did. You know, some time ago, we, my father used to have a football team, and, and we had an announcer who one day made this announcement that said, somebody put a note in his hand. He said, will everybody please stand for the singing of the national anthem, and it will be done acapulco by... <laughs> so, so if my boom box doesn't cooperate, I'm not saying Acapulco. Go ahead, Dr. Porter. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong. To love pure and chase from afar To try when your arms are too weary To reach the unreachable star This is my quest to follow that star No matter how hopeless, no matter how far 
to fight for the right without question or pause. To be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this that one man scorn and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for the right without question of all. To be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest, that my heart will lie peaceful and calm. When I'm late to my rest And the world will be better for this That one man scorned and covered with scars Still strong with his last ounce of courage To Next, we will have words of wisdom and then our benediction. It was borrowed. <laughs> <laughs> no, trust me, it's his. It's his. And he has earned that. Brothers and ladies and gentlemen, it's only fitting at a time like this that we not only recognize a great man, but as the ladies in the audience would say, the staff and Brother Stanley who reminded me, behind every great man is a great woman. And as the minister shared and talked about that great mother that's behind him, we have, it's a little token, for you to take back to her and let her know that we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you so much. We thank you. We and Brother Stanley made sure that we were going to do that. And just to be really brief, just let me, let me say this. At a time like this, when we have 45 talking about war, when we have people in Charlottesville taking the lives of innocent people and people being hurt, when we have times when black men are being shot down by those who want to serve and protect, when we have a time where voting rights are being taken and a suppression, when we have a time where criminal justice is being turned back, when we have a time where our education system is being tapped, there's no greater time than for us to come together as one. When I say that we are one, Omega men recognize that this world is too big to think about just one. It's all of us. 
it's the alphas, the kappas, the sigma. All of us have to come together as one to make that difference. Both the Christians and the Muslims, we all have to come together as one. We must put aside any petty differences and recognize those who are out there in the vineyard who care about the least of us. And as we go forward, we must continue this level of consciousness. And the most important tool and the most powerful tool that we have is the vote. 45 is in because we didn't go do what we needed to do. But we must, we must come together and make sure that we go out and we win the local election, that we win the state election, that we win the national election, that we get these mean-spirited people who don't care about us out of office. So when we get someone in there who wants to do for us, that they will give that support that's needed that they didn't give to our president. But you know, it, it comes true. They say sometimes you don't miss me until I'm gone. And there's a whole lot of people missing our president. But the only way that we have a chance of getting somebody in who cares about us is that we put everything else aside and we own what happened last time and that we go to the polls together. Omega men will use their resources. We will make sure that we educate people. We'll make sure that we mobilize. We'll make sure that we get them registered. And we'll make sure that we're at the polls. And we'll make sure that when we get to the polls, that nobody will be intimidated because we're men first. But that scholarship lets us know what we have to do. Mr. Farrakhan, thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring us. Supreme Council here, would you please stand with me? It is indeed our honor and our pleasure to have you here and to make these presentations to you. We love you, we support you, and we're going to go together as one. Thank you. Yes. And if I could, before, before we do the benediction, Brother Stephen, where are you? And the committee that worked with him. Give them a round of applause for doing an outstanding job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We will now have our benediction by Minister Rose. Can we please stand? I don't know about you, but I feel just a little more empowered after tonight. I have just a little more hope than I had before I came in this building, and I'm a little more encouraged. My brothers and sisters, as we leave this place but never, ever leave the presence of God, I declare that the best is yet to come. May the favor of God come past you like the waters of the sea. And as we depart from one another, keep in mind that God's presence is always with us and his promises are always sure. May the grace of God be with you now, henceforth, and forever until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Come